I'm a saint today. You know, uh, probably a lot of the people that get called saints after they're dead, they may well not even have been one. You don't become a saint after you're dead. You have to be a saint by being in Jesus while you're alive. And that's a position. Now, it, by that will, we're sanctified. Notice in verse 14, for by one offering, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Now, I have been, by the which will I've been sanctified by the offering of the body of Jesus once for all. Now, by that offering, in verse 14, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Now, I believe tonight I'm probably looking at a lot of saved folks. I've heard almost all your testimonies personally. It's not, I may, there may be a few exceptions, but for the most part, I've, I know most of you, and I just feel like you're telling me the truth. So I think you're saved. Maybe an exception or two, but I think most of you know Christ. Do you know I'm looking at a bunch of perfect people tonight? That's hard for you to believe, isn't it? You say, you don't know my husband like I know him. Well, I understand that. I get it. Not all of us uh, would, would you recognize it immediately, unfortunately. But if you know Jesus, I mean, you get this. You have been perfected. Now, perfection does mean completion. Sometimes we associate that with the lack of error, the lack of sin, and so forth. Yes, we err. But what that tells me about my, my position goes along with this other aspect. Of course, it's talking about my position, but what's exciting about my position? What happened to my sin? My sin has been dealt with. Now, let me show you a couple of verses here. Look at cha uh, same chapter, verse 3. Speaking of those old sacrifices, it says, But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. Now, there were multiple sacrifices that went sp for specific sins. You do a trespass, you do this. If you uh, sin of ignorance, uh, you know, this, so forth. And then, if that wasn't enough, once a year the high priest comes. We've talked about that. God, obviously, was trying to remind these people through the law that they're sinners. It just kept coming up. This is why you need cleansing. Now, that's what happened with sin under the law. You were always reminded of it. What is the contrast of the new covenant? Well, look over at verse 16. He says in this same chapter in verse 16, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord, that I will put my law into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now, has God ever forgot anything? The only thing I know God's ever forgot is my sin. I will remember their sin no more. Now, I'm not going to try to uh, place that in some kind of a, a theological fix to say, does God under... There's nothing God doesn't know. But we know what the word remember means. And you know how a human being uses the word remember. So on my level, an understanding, in my human understanding, God says, let me tell you what happened to your sin. I remember them no more. Now, sometimes I do. Sometimes I remember them. So what has to be dealt with? Not only the memory, not only the fact that I'm in that position, but here's what something else the new covenant will do for me. It will deal with my conscience. Now, the conscience is a little deeper than just the fact that when I do something wrong, I feel bad about it. That's kind of a surface level. But the conscience came up in the previous chapter talking about the blood of Christ was able to cleanse our conscience. And again, I have a line drawn from all of these uh, connections of the word conscience, and it goes through all this chapter. And if you look at verse 2, it says, Then would they have not ceased to be offered, because the worshipers, once purged, should have no more conscience of sin. If they'd have worked, if they'd have been effective, if they'd have done the job, it would have been done. Uh, nobody combated the fact that they needed to keep offering these sacrifices because it did not deal with the deepest need of the man's conscience because it really was not fully accomplished yet. Now, when Jesus did, something was accomplished. You know, I don't place a huge emphasis, but I, I won't say no emphasis. I don't place as much emphasis on feeling as I do fact. I'd rather have some facts. But if you get the foundation of the fact established, you know, you will get some feeling. I like to live in a house. Now, we talk about the importance of a foundation. My house would be nothing without a foundation, and yours wouldn't either. You let it crack. 
you'll find out how important. Now, you can build it, put whatever you want to. That foundation cracks and moves. It's going to affect your house to the point that if it was work bad enough, it would just fall away. It, would, it wouldn't last. However, I don't want to live just on top of the foundation. I like the house. Now, once the foundation is laid, that's essential. There is some feeling involved. I don't know uh, of a much better feeling than a clean conscience. Now, how does that come? Is it because I deserve it? Oh, well, I've done a, I've lived so good this last week. I feel real good about it. I think I've, no, that, that won't last. That's, that's fleeting. That's back and forth. The conscience comes as I am allowed by God to take some facts and to come to grip with those theological facts. And my, I put two and two together and say, wait a minute. Jesus took care of my sin. I have met the demand in the sense of I haven't, I've, I've done what God said. I've confessed my sin. He's faithful and just to forgive me. Hey, I have a clean conscience. You know, there is a consequence to your sin if you're a Christian. The consequence is, first of all, it's a bad testimony. It, it grieves the Holy Ghost. It hinders your testimony. It, it mars your fellowship. But that is, a, that is a conscience issue. I don't want to bring reproach on the name of Christ. It bothers me if I brought reproach on his name. I don't want to go to prayer and to think, you know, I'm harboring something here and I just won't come clean and I know I can pray until I'm blue in the face, but if I regard, that word regard is the key word, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. That doesn't mean that if I've, have, if I've ever failed, he's not going to listen. It means if I know it's there and I just won't come clean. But when I agree with God, I can't make up for what I've done. I can't go back and repay him. But I can listen to the facts and I can say my conscience has been dealt with. Um, I want to just show you a, a verse real quickly over in John uh, 14. If you'll just flip there quickly. Keep your place. And it goes along this very thought. Jesus, of course, instructing his disciples and he talks about his commandment. Look at John 14, and this is a familiar part here in verse 16. He says, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you, and let yet a little while the world seeth me no more. But you shall see me, because I live, you shall live also. And at that day you shall know that I am in the Father, and ye in me, and I in you. Now look at that relationship word in verse 20, that verse. In that day you shall know that I am in the Father, and ye in me, and I in you. Now that's a, a deep uh, thought, if you'll take a moment and, and put it together, how we're related to the Father and to Jesus. And we're in him, and he is in us. Now, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Now, we know that those that know the Lord Jesus Christ have God's commandment and keep God's commandment. And God's talking about the in intimacy of the believer with the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a special relationship for the one who loves the Lord. And keeping his commandments obviously is to that. So this is, this is describing that relationship as well. Now go back to Hebrews. And I want you to notice now. We get, we've seen this, what it accomplishes. This ties together. But note, understanding the accomplishment of what Jesus did. Now notice the access. This is what the practical side of it. In verse 19, we read it in our text. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way. Do you know the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 3 concerning the law, that the letter killeth, the spirit giveth life. Now, by no means, and Paul even stops a couple of times in these chapters and, and says, now am I uh, casting disparity on the law? No, and no wise. Is, is the law holy and just and good? Absolutely, it's God's word. I mean, if I quoted you verses today out of the book of Deuteronomy, it's just as powerful as quoting it from the book of John. It's God's word. It's real. You've got to place it in its context. But the letter killeth. The spirit giveth life. Now, he says, by a new and living way, 
which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Now, I'll tell you what, I may not grasp everything that we're looking at in this chapter. You meditate on it, you put it together, you understand he's, he's given me a position in Christ, my conscience has been dealt with, my sins have been put away, but let me tell you where this becomes practical is you have boldness to enter into the presence of God. Now, you might take that for granted. Well, of course, we're, we're Christians. Isn't that what Christians pray? We read the Bible. I could just, any time, I can be riding down the road and I can pray. You know, God has given us such access to himself that I think sometimes we do take it for granted. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Now, even though we know that, we kind of take it for granted, people will say this sometimes, and I, and I get the aspect of the truth, but, you know, sometimes people will jokingly say something about, well, if I can get the preacher to pray for me, you know, maybe something will, God will listen to that, or maybe some other person they have high respect for, well, I'll tell you what, I like that person to pray for me. Don't, don't get me wrong. Some people know how to pray better than other people. But it's only because they know how. It's not because all of us couldn't attain that place. Do you realize the lowest, meanest, and I shouldn't say mean in the sense of, there are a lot of mean saints, but I'm talking about ordinary, okay? All right, uh, the, the most ordinary saints, that have been saved two days, isn't far along spiritually at all, can have a ear with God. As much as somebody who's been saved for 50 years walking with God. Why? Neither one of them earned it. It's based on the blood of Jesus. So when I start grasping, you say, boy, uh, if we could get through some of this deep stuff, man, it's making my brain, you know, smoke come out of my ears and so forth. And that may be, and it is deep. Uh, but, but part of this truth, you allow it to sink down. It's hard to get a hold of it. It's not even hard intellectually. It's hard to grasp that I am in Christ, an heir with God. Um, this old flesh sometimes, yes, it messes up, but I, my position does not change. And unless I, of course, regard iniquity in my heart or refuse to get something or grieve the Holy Ghost, I mean, beside that, I have not set myself back spiritually by, do, by doing wrong. I am still right with God when I get right with God. Now, my conscience says to me, well, you sort of set yourself back there. You might have confessed it and got it right, but you're back at ground zero well, you know what? Ground zero with Jesus is as high as you're ever going to get. It's, it's high enough. I'm perfect in him. I can now come before him with boldness and access with confidence. You know, do you think it would be God or the Holy Spirit who would tell you, well, you might have got that right, but you messed up. I want to see you prove it for a few days now. Uh, don't pray for a while till you show me you're serious. The Holy Spirit's never going to tell you that. If there's one thing the devil doesn't want a believer to do, is go to God and ask him for something. You know why? Because if you're a believer, Jesus said a significant statement, and he repeated it a couple of times, but he told his disciples, he said, Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. In other words, you folks hadn't really prayed yet. You've prayed. Moses knew how to pray. He got a hold of God. You know, Daniel and Job and Ezekiel, or Daniel and Job and Noah were, were referenced by God as great prayer warriors. They knew how to pray, and they prayed toward a certain uh, promise that God gave him. I mean, Hezekiah knew how to pray. He got a hold of God, and, and God listened to him. He knew what to base the prayer on. He, he found the promise. He said, as good as that might have been, he says, you disciples hadn't even learned how to pray yet. Hitherto have you not prayed in my name. He says, ask that your joy may be full. That tells me that he was going to give us a privilege in prayer. Hezekiah, Moses, Job, Daniel really didn't even have. As effective as they were, we now can pray in Jesus' name. That doesn't mean that I can just tack on a sentence at the end of my prayer and say, in Jesus' name. It means I can come in His name, boldly, before the throne of grace. If you want to write down Ephesians 3.12, it goes right along the way, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of Him. I'll tell you, many times I come to prayer and I have to remind myself of that very verse. I have to come and remind myself because if I don't, I'll think I'm not worthy to do this. I mean, God could point out some things now. I wouldn't be a very effective prayer warrior. 
But God, you told me I can come boldly before the throne of grace to obtain mercy. I have boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. And now I can call and God can answer. Now that's a wonderful truth that God has given us boldness to enter into his presence. And I hate, I hate to just continue to belabor this, but it's such a t- tremendous truth. That doesn't even mean that I can come into God now and feel that he can answer me. That's not what boldness means. Boldness doesn't even mean that I can come now and feel you know, very confident that it's okay to pray. It means that I can come in as a son who comes in and asks something from his father. And, you know, I don't know how your kids do, but my kids wouldn't think twice about coming in on a, on a certain night and, look, Dad, I'd like to go out to eat tonight. Well, are you going to pay for it? I mean, <laughs> you know, they don't mind asking you. I may say no, but they know that I'm not going to be irate just because they came in and said, would you like to go out to eat? I may say, well, no, we don't have any money to do that tonight since you wanted to eat out the last five nights in a row, you know, but uh, that don't mind to ask. Now, that's what Jesus was talking about. Would you ask, a, a, if your son asked for bread, would you give him a stone? If he asked for this, would you give him a serpent and so forth? This doesn't mean that I can come in and say, well, now, you know, as a neighbor kid coming over to his neighbor, uh, do you mind if I borrow your shovel or hammer or whatever it might be? I know we're good neighbors and friends, and maybe you'd lend it to me. That's not boldness. Boldness is coming in and saying, because I have this relationship, oh, yes, reverence, respect, I understand God's power, but with no hesitation to ask him for anything legitimately promised in the Bible. I mean, to come in with expectation and boldness to say, God, you know, you've promised this. Clearly, you're going to meet this need. You know, I think about the the promise in James 1 for wisdom. Do you know if you have wisdom, you can cover just about every other base. I mean, what is wisdom? Wisdom means God would impart to you the ability to handle whatever needs to be handled. That's what Solomon asked for. Solomon had wisdom to ask for wisdom. He says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. That doesn't say if any man lacks wisdom. Some people quote it that way. Lost man doesn't have this, this promise. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. That's the idea. He wouldn't unbraid you. He wouldn't say, look, you keep on asking for wisdom. You don't really have a right to keep asking me for that. No, he'll never upbraid you. But it says it gives it to him liberally and upbraideth not. It shall be given him. But then the next verse, let him ask in faith. Nothing wavering. For he that wavereth says a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. That man shall not receive anything of the Lord. Why would I waver when I'm based on the blood of Jesus? Don't waver. And then he brings this up again. Uh, Verse 23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering for he is faithful that promised why do I not waver it's not based on me it's based on the promise of God you know we often and I've done the same thing I'm not rebuking anybody for this but we often if we'll you know we hold up this book and say I believe this book amen but do we really I mean it's we do intellectually we do but in our heart if we'll believe it We won't waver. He says that we have a position here that is a unique position of relationship to give us boldness. And then I keep going in the verse real quickly here. In full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, as we talked about, and our bodies washed with pure water. You know, the idea here that we've been consecrated by God in the full assurance of our faith. You know, we have a peculiar relationship with God. A lost man, and you know this, but a lost person can't just go to God and ask him for something. Now, has God ever answered a prayer for a lost man? Maybe. I know every good gift and every perfect gift cometh from above. Plenty of lost people have said, God, if you will do X for me, then I'll serve you. And he did X for them, and they didn't serve He didn't end up serving him. You say, well, did God really do it? I, it, it was done. Every good and perfect gift is from above. Here's the difference. No lost man can expect God to answer him. He might. 
God's gracious. He's merciful. Who knows what God might do? I don't doubt there's been people in, uh, in the bottom of a, you know, in a terrible uh, accident and situation, and they've just called upon God, and God in his mercy may have rescued them just to let them live longer to hear the gospel. He may, but I don't go to God that way. I go to God if I'm praying with, and, and understand the truth with assurance. Now, I might pray for something I don't know God's will about. I believe God can lead me. And you know, what we do is we keep praying until God either answers it or changes our prayer. Now, I don't know if you've ever done that, but I've prayed and he's changed my prayer. I've realized after a while, I'm, I'm praying and my heart might have been right, but I'm not praying for the right thing. I'm trying to tell God how to answer it. I, if, if I'm, here's God, here's the way you've got to answer my prayer. Well, you can't do that. But you can go and say, God, I have a clear principle, a promise, and you, you've promised to meet it. I'm going to believe the Bible. It's a matter of faith. So it affects us as far as the access is concerned. And then, of course, we talked about the wavering. And I'm just going to leave. This ties into the second part of this chapter, so I'm going to leave this. It's too good to preach on. I can't, I can't just go this quick, you know, uh, for not forsaking yourself together, you know. Uh, we're going to use it Sunday morning, by the way, instead of Wednesday night. But anyway, uh, but anyway I'm going to save that to the next week to tie it into the next chapter. So we're out of time. We'll go ahead and stop there. Lord, how we thank you tonight for the Word of God. We thank you for the boldness and the access that we have into your throne. Lord, no doubt we tonight need to be sensitive to what offends you. Certainly, we don't want to grieve the Holy Ghost. But Lord, may we, when we confess our sin and we come into your presence, may we again revel in the blood of Jesus tonight, knowing that we come boldly into the holiest by his blood. May we be prayer warriors and may we seek you and may we see you do miraculous things as a result of our relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. 372 tonight will be our song. Let's go ahead and sing a stanza of 372, and then we'll be dismissed. Sweet.